Thank you very much for coming. My name is Justin Brandenburg. Uh, I'm a resident solutions architect for Databricks. Um, part of the discussion today is mostly like a, a passion project for me. It's something I've been very interested in in addition to some of the other work that we do. Um, but it's kind of an emerging area, especially with a lot of more reinforcement learning emerging in popular research lately. Uh, and being able to scale and discuss how to process large data sets in a distributed environment, specifically multi-agent, uh, is something that's still kind of being explored, um, being managed, understanding the difficulties and challenges associated with it. Um, so hopefully we can speak to some of those today. Um, I can highlight some of the things that I've worked on, some of the challenges I've faced. Uh, maybe it could help you guys in some of your future work. So I'm a member of the professional services team at Databricks. So it's uh, typically after organization buys Databricks, uh, we go in and assist, assist migrating from any professional uh, previous environments, um, big data, Hadoop, uh, other type of DBMSs, um, anywhere from strictly BI to ETL to machine learning to data science, everywhere in between. Um, my background's in economics, funny enough, though. Uh, I kind of fell into data science by accident, and through there, I got into cyber as well as IoT. Um, but I'm based in Washington, DC, so there's a lot of cyber, there's a lot of economics there, uh, so you can find a, kind of get your hand in all kind of cool work there. Uh, my background's mostly in economics, though, and that's kind of what led me down to the whole uh, agent reinforcement learning, multi-behavioral analysis type work, um, in addition to some of the other type of standard machine learning data science projects you work on. Uh, some of the things I want to talk about today, um, just talk about just complex systems in general, difference between complex and complicated, uh, different types of problems that are involved uh, in system dynamics. Uh, as well as getting to how can we approach it with uh, PySpark, uh, specifically what types of problems we can we an analyze using in a distributed environment. Um, walk through kind of an example uh, with a demo, kind of walk through a notebook. Actually, I have two, so we can kind of go through those. It's kind of a uh, multiple, multi-purpose type of uh, analysis. And then quick summary, and then hopefully we can do some discussions. I know lunch is going to be served soon, so. I don't want to be that guy, but um, hopefully you guys will get to my hands. So one of the interesting things is that over the last couple of years, I've started work on, working on different projects and things like that. Typically, like when I first started out, I was working just you know, on my desktop or laptop, focusing on a single problem. It was very modular, very self-contained. Uh, didn't really know where it fit into the bigger realm of overall systems that uh, the products were fitting in. Um, as things have become more connected, you're starting to see that there's a lot more interrelated components. Um, there's a lot more information that's being shared, a lot more information that was unknown previously that would have been valuable, especially in certain areas of decision making. Um, how do you evaluate those new pieces of information? How do you evaluate or account for instances where you don't have all that information? How do you kind of come up with different strategies or um, uh, policies or ways to evaluate what's the best outcome for your organization? What's the best outcome for your specific group or for your specific uh, organization? Policies that lead to ideal outcomes are some of the most difficult ones to encounter in an organization because there's just so much unknown. You know, whether it's an HR-related question you know, how much should we offer remote work versus how little? Who do we offer it to? Um, what kind of benefit should we offer? Who does it benefit? Should we offer it to everybody? Should we make it something so it's only for a specific type of people? How do you model something like that? How do you evaluate something like that? And that's kind of where certain types of problems where you can kind of evaluate decision making at the micro and the macro level allow you to start to see, get a bigger picture of what's kind of out there. <coughs> There was a great book uh, 
couple years ago that I read when I was in grad school called The Origin of Wealth. And it's actually a bit misleading, um, but it's by a McKinsey fellow, Eric Beinhocker. Beinhocker. Um, but it's mostly discussing how, in traditional economic thought, it was always that you'll eventually get to equilibrium. Supply will meet demand. The invisible hand will eventually guide everything towards a proper allocation of resources for everybody. And that's more of a philosophical analysis of how systems work, because inevitably, there is never going to be any equilibrium. You're never going to fully achieve a perfect balance between all components, because one, you don't necessarily have all the information. In fact, the only thing you can probably guarantee is that everybody has imperfect information. Um, when that kind of occurs, you have to start making assumptions. And then when you're doing this, how do you make those assumptions under imperfect information, with lack of information, who has more information, and essentially dealing with uncertainty. And if you're dealing with you know, more statistics, you're dealing with you know, error, you're dealing with white noise, that's kind of the uncertainty that you want to account when you're dealing with more of a policy analysis. It's like, what can we not account for? How do we model that? How can we kind of evaluate over the course of not just one person, but many people or many units within a business? How do we account for all those people as well? Additionally, if there's something we don't see or something we do implement, what kind of emerging behavior can we start to uh, expect to see? Um, typically, when you mix things together, you get new things. Um, get a lot of different people together, you get good conversation, you get people to come up with new ideas, you emerge with new outcomes, uh, new friends, new discussion points, new areas of research. That kind of emergence is what leads to a lot of interesting things when you set up complex systems and try to analyze that, model those complex systems, because then you can start to identify what kind of emerging behavior could lead to better outcomes versus traditional outcomes. <coughs> Excuse me. Complex system modeling. You kind of had your standard uh, statistical analysis. You have more data science related derivative insight. Uh, you have machine learning where you know, you're trying to apply generated insight, developing models and apply it and predict it on new incoming data. Complex system modeling is more about evaluating you know, what's going on with interactions. Um, how do you account for unknowns? How do you account for one person maybe having more information, but you can evaluate how you want to attempt to talk to them? How do you account for random events, um, traffic accidents, exogenous, exogenous shocks to market like within a stock market? How do you account for uh, interesting uh, elections? <laughs> how do you account for uh, um, policy decisions that impact the military? So these are all type of things that if you're modeling in a, a macro landscape, you want to be able to maybe come up with a way to account for. Um, there's a couple of different ways of doing this. You know, none of them are tried and true. All of them have their own derivative kind of ways and methods. Agent-based modeling is something that I studied in grad school. It's more about setting up and establishing an environment, establishing a parameters or essentially a box around that you can then put individual agents. And agents can be people. They can be. Uh, organizations, they can be stocks, they can be anything like that, and different organizations within a stock market, um, just to see how they interact. See if you can mimic a real life behavior. <clears throat> One of the most famous is Schelling's segregation model. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but uh, it's essentially just with a few small rules, essentially that if you have two groups of people and you establish a certain bias where they would only, one group would only want to live next to somebody else if the other two people were in the same group as them. So if I was a blue person, I'd be fine having a red person live next to me as long as I had two other blue people on the other side of me. And once you establish those basic rules, on the left you see kind of randomness, but on the right you start to see structure and things start to develop just based on simple rules like that. <clears throat> the sugar skate model by Robert Excel and Josh Epstein is also something similar where 
how do economies develop? Well, in the sugar skate model, they essentially put, made a grid, and they randomly assigned people on that grid with very limited vision and resources. And they essentially said, okay, we're going to put sugar over here. And the ones closest to it are the ones that are just endowed with wealth because they're the closest and they can start to accumulate that. And all they can do is feed and look. And eventually you start to do something where, okay, now they can trade. Now they can uh, save. Now they can bargain. Now they can procreate and have families. So how does this, see how this wealth develops just by random assignment. Um, game theory, prisoners develop a dilemma. Discrete event simulation like we just discussed. Um, how to account for traffic accidents or um, DDoS attacks on your cyber network. And then we also dip down to Markov decision processes. Essentially identifying optimal outcomes based on a series of actions and states as you transition to. Keeping in mind that you can always go back, keeping in mind that there's always a better opportunity, but there's not always going to have the best information. <clears throat> One of those could be the traveling salesman, essentially optimization, trying to find the best route to uh, meet your outcome or get home as fast as you can. <clears throat> so I want to focus on MDPs today. Um, MDPs are kind of something that I've only been really looking at for the last like year or so. Uh, it's kind of an area of really interest for me. Um, just more about, especially with the emergence of reinforcement learning and, you know, autonomous drones and autonomous uh, vehicles and things like that, uh, MDPs are a core component of that and they're a core component of reinforcement learning. But the basis of it is essentially going through a series of states, actions, trying to identify the most optimal outcome for your group. <clears throat> have you guys seen Infinity War? I have. In it, <laughs> Doctor Strange, when, I'm going to spoil it, but when they're about to lose, he goes through, he's got the time stone, and he's going through 14,605,000 different outcomes to see if he can identify the most optimal outcome for which the world will not blow up. There was one. But he did it all through like a series of you know, going through all these different outcomes, evaluating all these different agents, and these agents being his team members on the Avengers, the Hulk, which is my son's favorite, um, smashing things. But it's just essentially how he was going about it. He was essentially going through having everybody in his group perform their role, taking stock or of their state, current state, looking at the next set of actions that they could do, the possible outcomes of those actions, going through, evaluating the current state, then moving on to the next one. And then 14 million different types of outcomes, there was only one that would have proved fruitful for their group. The interesting thing about this is <clears throat> that even when I was watching this, I kind of saw this when I was uh, watching the movie, and I was like, oh my god, that's an MDP. Because not only is he doing it, and it's a, a multi-agent MDP, because not only is he doing it for himself, he's also doing it for everybody else in his group. So it's a micro-analysis of their behavior and a macro-analysis of his behavior as well. And so they get a micro-policy for each individual agent and a macro-policy for all their other components of the team in general, as well as the greater superhero Marvel Universe. And I thought it was a great example of a multi-agent MDP, and that's the time stone. <clears throat> so what is a Markov decision process? And I'm not going to lie, I'm not an expert on MDPs. I'm just somebody who's been reading a lot about it, tinkering with it, hacking out stuff, you know, coming to share my ideas, my successes, my challenges, hoping to glean some insight, especially because there's a lot of smart people in this room. But essentially, it is a series of states. It's a state of a system. It's a state of a person's behavior. It's a state of an organization. And it essentially is, you know, what are they doing on Monday and the certain decisions that will get them to the next day on Tuesday? Um, what kind of actions or decisions will lead to a better outcome, lead to greater rewards, versus something that if they make a decision that's not necessarily in their best interest, 
could lead to penalties or possibly detriment to the organization. Typically, it's applied from the single perspective of one kind of global entity, and this global entity could be an agent, it could be the president of a company, it could be head of HR, it could be a general, um, it could be a head of, uh, for example, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is one of the customers I work with. They're responsible for monitoring the grid for the entire eastern United States. So they capture data from 36 different kind of PMUs or sourcers every few seconds for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <clears throat> And they're constantly monitoring it for resource allocation to see where they can take energy from one place and put it to another where it'll be better used and not be wasted. Economic planning, um, estate planning. You know, I go to a financial analyst. I'm not as young as I used to be, but I'm not as old as my dad or my mom. They're going to be let more risk averse. They're going to want something that literally will just give them guaranteed growth, whereas if I want something that's maybe will give me a little bit more short-term explosive growth, then I'll be a little bit more risk ready. And that would be my personal optimal policy versus what my parents would get. <coughs> Logistics planning. You know, when I sat with the uh, United States Postal Service, and they were trying to optimize a better route planning where instead of having one post, uh, postman drop a package on at a strict, uh, strict USPS location, they wanted to actually coordinate so they could actually literally be driving by each other and hand it off. Down to the seconds, or down to the minutes, or down to the meters, because now we have that level of granularity in the data that we're being captured. And we haven't even gotten into talk, talking about the data that can contribute to improving all this process. We're just talking about the hypothetical theories that could come from just knowing being a subject matter expert in your domain. <clears throat> risk management, you know, if you're going to build a house in Florida, there's probably going to be a hurricane. Build it in concrete. And robotics, frozen lake uh, example. If you're a robot, you're trying to find the most optimal path to get from one point to another without stepping into the hole in the lake. It'd be a grid, be 4x4, 10x10, what have you. Finding the fastest, safest path that will get it from point A to point B. So why PySpark for MVP? <clears throat> I mean, a lot of the examples for reinforcement learning I see are optimizing for a single agent, which in some cases is, is honestly the best place to start. But most organizations or most uh, complex systems don't operate in a vacuum. They're not operating independently. They're operating with a lot of other organizations or a lot of other uh, entities. So a lot of real world problems can't be modeled by just one uh, one reinforcement learning model for one particular agent or one particular iRobot that's going around your floor. You want to be able to ca capture information for multi, uh, multiple categories, multiple different people, multiple demographics, multiple different uh, um, stocks, uh, weather components, things like that. Because all of that provides better insight into your model and how it behaves. Because you can essentially, instead of having a wide open uh, barometer of what to expect, you can narrow down and have specific states and specific act, uh, actions and specific transition states and probabilities to make uh, finer granular models and finer granular simulations and to optimize all your behavior. <clears throat> MDPs are simulations. Not only do they generate a lot of data, they can ingest a lot of data. So they can be optimized to just improve performance. They can literally be much like the um, the shelling segregation model, they can be stood up with just literally basic parameters. But they can be improved upon and improved upon just by adding more and more insight, more and more um, information. Um, I'm going to get in my example, but you know, having more information about how to tax people on a toll road. You know, do we tax them if they have an electronic vehicle? Do they tax them if they have a gas vehicle? What are the benefits they have for one or the other? Um, that type of granularity uh, improves overall policy and allows you to plan ahead, not only for capture budget for now, but also budget for later. <clears throat> so I figured a lot with this. Um, 
I find the, the easiest thing for me is actually running NDPs on the RDDs. So I know uh, data frames are kind of the, the standard data object when working with Spark these days, but and, you know, initially they are all RDDs, um, which are essentially key value stores. And that actually works a lot better because you can assign different attributes to those key value stores. And you can add others, you can remove them, but they can be independently identified and actually distributed out and transformed independently versus having to transform an entire data frame. <clears throat> you can map specific functions through these key values. Um, each row essentially becomes an independent entity. Um, and that's kind of one of the distinctions that you'd have to make because with you're working in Spark, you're working in a distributed environment. If you were do building a reinforcement learning model or an agent-based model on just a single node or a single laptop, you could be using something like Pandas, but it would all be operating in memory on your single machine. So it would be able to identify the shared state of all the other people around you. When you're working in PySpark, it's a little bit more challenging because essentially each independent entity is operating without the knowledge of those around them, or limited knowledge, because there is no way to essentially share data within a data frame or share data within an RDD at each epoch. So then, where do, how do we identify what's the best method or what's the best utility for running MDPs using PySpark? Well, it's looking at approaches that require both a macro and a micro feel, similar to what we saw with Doctor Strange. <clears throat> Agents are the kind of the key entities that interact with this environment. Um, they make actions, they evaluate by receiving observations, they receive uh, eventual rewards, but their goal is to identify their optimal behavior based on the policy parameters of which they operate in. Those policy parameters are essentially the boundaries of which their lives are determined. Um, Behavior is often, the behavior of these agents is often done through a, a sequential manner. It's a sequential type of model. Essentially, it goes through time, and these times can be done through seconds, they can be done through months, they can be done through years, they can be done through weeks. Um, but essentially, at each particular time step, the state changes and action occurs. Take an evaluation of your current state. From based on your current state, you then move on to your next uh, uh, particular state based on your transition probabilities that you have available to you. <clears throat> so here's an example of uh, kind of my, one of my first actually uh, attempts at implementation of uh, instantiating agents within a, uh, a PySpark framework. And this is actually coming from a, uh, a data frame. <clears throat> so if I have an exi existing data set, in this case, it was for a, cu a customer a couple years ago, and essentially they were running these what-if what scenario analysis. Like, they're an oil, oil and gas company. What happens if they get exog exogenous shots or the market changes within the current week? They have a project plan for all their resources, for all their wells going out for weeks, months. They have resources associated with it. They have labor costs. They have uh, foundational costs that they're not going to recoup. Um, they need to know with a high probability, is the market going to stay the same? If that's the case, what's the best process or what's the best allocation of our resources over this time frame that will probably get, return us the most ROI? So they gave me a data frame, or a table, excuse me, of existing projects, you know, very similar use, uh, with the columns just like these. You know, they had project ID, start date, current date, um, you know, labor, that being a number of resources or uh, FTEs that were on the ground, um, all the equipment that would cost to be on these projects, and it varied. But you essentially wanted to find the best combination. You wanted to have the best uh, items in your knapsack stack that you could actually then identify the biggest uh, bang for your buck. So essentially, I created a project class or a projects agent for these projects, where I instantiate that I'm going to self-align all these particular features or attributes to these particular columns within this table, and then I'm going to initialize it later by calling that particular class and applying it on top of my RDD once I've instantiated it. <clears throat> now, if I wanted 
come up with my own kind of, say I didn't have a lot of data. One of the good things about agent-based modeling, uh, uh, discrete event planning, even MDPs, is that you can actually infer behavior just by casual observation. And then you can start to cultivate more refined uh, analysis based on the outcome and have, how often you refine your model. So in this case, if I didn't have any data, and I just had kind of a out of the blue idea that I was just going to generate my own data sets, my own agents. I wasn't going to use a pre-populated thing of customers. I was just going to come up with my own citizens, and I was going to assign them different attributes, different characteristics. You know, they were going to be this of this demographic with this amount of money in their bank account, and in this case, this type of driver. So create my agent class, just independent, where they receive a unique ID of which then I can then at least monitor different transitions. And then I go ahead and instantiate that class by creating agents with uh, particular attributes associated with them. Interesting about it is that you can still leverage certain characteristics of the Python ecosystem, like NumPy. Like you can use, generate random integers, random uniform uh, values to then help you specify different, uh, different characteristics, like, I don't know, if car type index, a random uniform between zero and one. So if it was the actual value was above zero, or excuse me, above 0 0.50, then they drove a gas-powered vehicle. Otherwise, they drove a electronic vehicle. That's something I love about Amsterdam, by the way. Like, I love all the EVs. So cool here. Um, but then you can start to assign different attributes. You can start to identify different demographics of your, of your population that you can then assign specific rules and behaviors and policies of which they can operate in. <clears throat> If I want to create actions and transitions. The row is essentially the RDD value. Sorry, I keep walking in front of you, my mistake. Um, the row is essentially the RDD value. It's the RDD element, the single line, the key value that is storing all the data for our particular agent. That is the specific entity or specific object that we're then performing all these transitions on. And these transitions can occur in place, but they can occur over time. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. But you can specify different epochs. You can do different loops, things like that, to essentially keep the ball rolling in terms of, OK, if from today, if we have a car driver that eventually wants to switch to an electronic vehicle, you know, and he has this amount of payments left on his, his current car, and his to total costs are this, you know, uh, what part, what car in the future, what period in the future would he eventually transition based on our analysis? And finally, when I want to execute it. So on the top, I created a MDP function that essentially captures the, the row, the RDD uh, agent captures the time, in this case, specifying t. So in this case, for the example I'm going to show, I did 36, and 36 is 36 months. And the policy, so there's a couple of different ways. I've had success, I've had failure, I've had, it depends on the type of policy and how I'm trying to apply it on the agent. But I can then specify the type of policy that I want to run on top of my agents. And you'll see within the function, I stand up an independent list where essentially I'm going to be writing on my output. And this output becomes essentially another key value that I can then transition into a data frame, write it into a table, perform additional analysis on it later, and look for optimizations and, and tweak it, and then rerun it again. I, and I create my agent, and I initialize, initialize my agent attributes. So when I essentially created my agent, it was more of a default. Like everybody was one race, everybody was one gender, everybody had no money. And then when you initialize specific agent attributes, then you start to say, OK, this, this agent's a woman, this agent's a man, this is a baby, this baby's driving a car. So now we can start to see their behavior and probably not that good at driving. And then how do we want to apply the MDP using the policy? So then we specify the agent, the time. We specify the mechanism of how we want to capture the data, and then the policy of which is going to be applied on the data. And then all we want in return 
is the actual output. In this case, it's going to be our empty list or an empty file of MTP data, excuse me, in MDP data that will capture all their out, uh, results from our simulation. <coughs> so in the kind of example I've been working on, you know, if a road, say within a community or within, for example, the Washington DC area, there's a beltway. And then we also have a direct access route that gets you from the beltway to Washington DC downtown, but at specific times of day, it's toll only. And that's mostly to relieve congestion because either people are willing to pay the toll and the toll increases based on the number of cars on it. It's gotten up to $45 before for an eight minute trip. Or you can kind of go around the other, the other roads <clears throat> to encourage people to buy more uh, environmentally friendly cars, things like that. You know, they offer people the ability to drive electronic vehicles and so on and so forth. So they get different policies than the gas guzzlers do. They don't have to pay tolls because they're in EVs. They get tax credits. But then their kind of actions and decisions are a little bit different because, you know, based on looking at the Tesla price in, in the US, it's like $40,000. That's a little bit more than most of the cars that me and my friends drive. So I'd be incurring that higher monthly payment, but I wouldn't be paying any tolls. So what's good for me wouldn't necessarily be good for another person. So how do we evaluate the, the common ground between different people in your community and identifying the proper tax policy to meet those needs of those people to make sure that the congestion doesn't do too bad on the roads within our community? So I instantiate just 50,000 different new cars. I just put them in a data frame. Create my agents, give them a driver ID, wrap it up into an RDD. Let's look at it ahead for, let's plan it for three years, so 36 months. And for this particular case, I had three policies, so different variations of, of you know, do they get tolls, do they not get tolls, do they get a credit? But I want, in this case, I'll run policy one, and I'm going to apply it using a flat map. So this is all just gets run and executed and gives me my output. That's all it is. So you, you're essentially queuing up all your, act, uh, all your transitions, your transformations, prior to actually executing your MDP. And when you do it, it's performing essentially a transformation on top of an RDD. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I'll walk through this quickly because I know we have a few minutes and you guys are being very patient, so thank you. Um, this is basically just uh, what I was talking about earlier, electronic vehicles and toll lanes. You know, if uh, certain people have the ability to uh, take the tolls, they will. Otherwise, people, you know, they'll look at the opportunity cost of whether they actually want to sit in traffic or actually pay to go take the toll lane. But unfortunately, more people are actually just willing to pay, and also more people are getting electronic vehicles. So now, as a community, are we dealing with more congestion than we initially planned for? And then how do we alleviate that? Because initially, we had only budgeted to make the lanes wider or install new lanes four years from now, but now it looks like we're going to need them two years from now. What kind of incentives or what kind of policies could we put in place to make individual commuters change their behavior? So we'll have micro uh, policies and micro behavioral changes that will affect the global macro multi-agent environment. And mul the multi so we'll have, excuse me, micro policies and macro policies. And we'll see how they interact and we'll see how the outcome comes. <clears throat> The agents in this example are commuters. Approximately 10% drive electronic vehicles. Among the commuters that drive out, uh, gas vehicles, some have paid off, some have not. How does that influence their decision to maybe purchase an electronic vehicle? I don't know. This is just my own kind of noodling in my head. Um, each month, you know, they evaluate how, many, how much they spend in tolls, um, what are their savings, um, you know, do they show a pre preference for short-term or long-term rewards, AKA, hey, I'm, I know that I'm paying in tolls, but I can't afford a higher car payment, even though it would remove gas, it would remove uh, tolls, it would remove a lot of money that I necessarily would be fixing, but I'm focusing on my short-term rewards versus my long-term gains. Um, Whereas electronic vehicle folks are more interested in savings due to the fact that they don't have to pay tolls or they have to get gas.
if I am a gas, a gas, a gas commuter, do, and I have the ability to actually make a uh, switch, do I want to? Like, what are my incentives to do so? Can I be something that, if we identify specific characteristics of our specific agents, can we identify ones that might switch earlier, and maybe we can motivate them to hold off while we provision more uh, money in our budget to actually uh, um, meet the needs of our increased congestion roads? Policies. So these are the policies, some of the policies that I would kind of change. Remove the price credit. Uh, make some of the EV owners actually pay a, a small percentage of tolls. So if a gas guzzler has to pay $5, they would pay $1. Um, toll uh, EV commuters at a lower rate versus uh, the current rate. So how do we identify the best policy associated with our MDP um, simulation? Well, there's a couple of different ways. Um, value iteration method, policy iteration, and linear programming. Each other pluses in and pros and cons, so, excuse me. Value iteration method actually identifies based on discrete time events, a uh, finite uh, horizon, eventually it'll converge. And, and if I mean converge, it'll essentially identify, you know, a proper balance between the number of electronic vehicles on the road versus the number of, of gas guzzlers on the road, identifying to the most commuting time versus the amount of money and tolls they're going to incur. Policy iteration is essentially more of hey, it's just going to go off and uh, we don't have a lot of shared information between our agents, so we're just going to identify the one that gives us the most money. We're going to give us one that uh, gives us the fewest cars on the road. Uh, linear programming is more <clears throat> essentially identifying a series of constraints. You know, if uh, I'm only going to be this tall and I'm only going to uh, be able to jump this high, those are my constraints, so I'm not necessarily going to make it in pro basketball. But maybe I can make it on JV. We're going to use policy iteration for this because we have many, we don't have a finite horizon. Um, essentially, it could come and go at any time, but I didn't necessarily have a way to converge. And I'm just was going to walk through the experiment real quick. So, if you guys can see this. So, I'm setting up my agent class, but I want to be able to distribute it out and, and spread it across the cluster. So I can keep it on a single node, but I want to keep it uh, accessible so I can execute it across all nodes in my environment. And this can, I, in this particular case, uh, I put it in a Databricks notebook, but I could have easily just put it in a, a Python script and just, uh, if you have distributed capability and SSH components within your cluster, it can be accessed across the cluster and called upon, and those functions can actually be executed and applied on your agents. So initialize my variables, import my uh, uh, agent class. Here's the script component, or if you wanted to use a Databricks notebook, um, you can go ahead and import it in. Create some default parameters. So, okay. I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Oh, here we go. Yes, I do. Um, is that better? Sorry, guys. I'll put this on GitHub, too, so you guys can look at it, too. Is that better, guys? Okay. Um, so like I said before, if you don't have a lot of information, you can make some assumptions. So I didn't have access to the DMV. I don't have an idea of oh, I'll drive specific cars, so I can, I don't know, I'm making some assumptions about how much gas is, how much a loan payment is per month, uh, the average tank size in gallons of a car, uh, refueling per month, approximately 2.5, and then you know, average tolls per month, which would be $25. Instantiate my agents. You know, this can be as many as, you, or essentially, this could be as broad or as granular as you want. Um, but like I said before, I essentially made them all gas guzzlers, uh, special, uh, specialized uh, random integers between, give me a distribution between how much the car loan was, um, depreciation, so on and so forth. And the interesting thing is, you can once you apply a specific attribute, you can then use it to create new attributes, like I did here with the car loan and you know, deprecation. Um, you can also infer the uh, publicly available components, as well as just assigning everything to zero, which you're going to popu populate later. 
So now I want to uh, specify my two groups. So in this case, I have uh, my gas commuters. You know, they have a, a different range of components. You know, they could some may get on the toll lanes a lot, some may not get on at all, some may get on quite often or just marginally. You know, approximate their commuter costs. You know, in some cases it could be a lot more, in some cases not that much. Um, so we want to identify uh, the number of payments associated with how much they're paying on that car. And then maybe they paid everything off. And so now the only thing they're doing is just incurring commuting costs. So what, what's the incentive for them to go and get a new car if the uh, car payment is the same as uh, if they were going to just be paying that for tolls? Here's what I set up for the commuters and electronic vehicles, somewhat similar. I made some assumptions that electronic vehicle would be more expensive, the monthly payment would be more expensive, um, so on and so forth. Initialize my agents. So I've done kind of the bulk up there. Now I'm essentially just calling them right here. It's very similar to some object-oriented uh, paradigms, trying to leverage some functional components as well. So this is kind of where it gets a little verbose. A lot of elf, if else statements. But these can be decomposed depending on how um, modular you want to get. But I'm essentially saying, you know, at each epoch or at each time step, update their status. How much were their, how much were their tolls this week? How much was their gas this week? How much was their total transportation cost? Did they make a, or, sorry, this month? Did they make a car payment? Have their car payments gone down? Have they paid off their car? I just want these updated. I want these to be updated within the RDD that I've done, uh, uh, determined. And then I want that all written out to file so that I can analyze it later. To find a uh, function that maybe they do want to change a uh, vehicle. So after a certain point, if their car payments are zero, they just want to go ahead and switch. And it doesn't have to be all of them, it could be a percentage. So then at that point you can specify. Specify the policies. So in this case, if I say I want policy one, which in this case, uh, they don't get any credit, they don't pay any tolls. Uh, policy two, they do have to pay tolls. Policy three, they get uh, credit, but they do have to pay a lot more in tolls. I want to update my attributes at each uh, particular epoch. So these are, all, these are the core attributes I'm concerned about for my analysis. And then I want to append it to my MB, MD, uh, MDP empty list, in this case, it's a um, proxy variable that, I'll, that stands in for my MDP data. Execute the policy on that particular month. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. This one was executed for that particular month, and then do it for all the months. So now we can start doing it for a specific duration of time. So then now I'm saying, OK, give me my time, 36 months. At each, at each particular uh, uh, value of m, it's going to execute all those different things we just talked about. It's going to update the status. It's going to give me new information, but also recording all the previous information so I can see the lineage in terms of what decisions or what transitions took, transitions took place. My MDP simulation function. And then here I'm going to actually create my agents. <laughs> I'm going to create my data frame, how many agents I want, the time, these are the columns for the, what the data frame or the specific uh, fields that are when they're, when they're done. I'm going to go ahead and execute it. I want to order by month and ID. And I want to review the output. So I can start to see, OK, this is a month, this is a policy, this is the ID, this is a vehicle type, car value, number of payments, so on and so forth. And now I want to see it for 36 months. Here, let me show that. So we're still on month one for all 50,000 agents. I want to see my aggregate results so I can actually see if there's a certain point where these two are equal. Or if I had a, a, a number in mind of the number of EV vehicles and the number of gas to equal an optimal uh, amount of money that we want to receive in tolls. 
as you can see, they're not changing. I have a bug in my code that I was up very late trying to figure out, and I apologize for that. Um, but essentially, that would give you an opportunity to identify you know, what type of things or what type of components you want to adjust within your model. Just have one more slide to show you guys. Thank you for being patient. Um, this, uh, additional considerations. So discounting. You know, especially when we're dealing with uh, uh, preferences and behavior, essentially what something is, value, uh, is valued at now will not necessarily be the same value tomorrow. So it's, it's important to identify like a, a specific discount factor that you can essentially determine, okay, are my needs more for near term or long term? And then how does that affect the overall agent's decision? How does it affect first individual agents and overall components? Um, the transition policy probabilities might not stay the same. You know, the number of people who want to migrate might change because gas went down to below $2. So how do I account for that? That's more of an exogenous shock or discrete time event that maybe I can include in my MDP. Did I choose the right agent attributes? This being, you know, was I looking at car payments? Does that really matter? Um, do they really care about total cost? Should I be looking at some other component? Maybe it's commuting time. Maybe they, the extra five minutes means more important to them than actually paying in the toll. Um, and just also, just adding random behavior. Um, you know, people just want to switch, buy new things, just impulse, like my father-in-law who just does things without randomly. So some of the future things that I'm, I plan on looking into, um, you know, I'd be happy to talk about this with you guys, is you know, there are optimization components within PyTorch and TensorFlow to help leverage individual agents, but then I want to see how it does in a multi-agent uh, environment. Um, you know, and more of like a Nash equilibrium component, like is what's best for the current agent, best for the overall group? Um, how do we share information between epochs? So like I said before, we're in a distributed environment. We don't, we're not on a single node. So there isn't like a shared state that all the agents have information. So I've kind of been evaluating different things, talking to one of my buddies outside, uh, it gave me a good idea. But you know, is it possible to just have local information just by all the agents that are on a single partition versus all spread out within the, uh, the cluster. And that's it. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much. I know we're over. Questions? Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Thanks. Because uh, in classical MDP sort of framework, you want to identify the best policy. And here it seems like you had three prefix policies. And so it was more about the evaluation of these policies or... Yeah. The, the, so the exploration in the title, I didn't understand. Uh, yeah. So one of the things I was working on, I didn't finish, was like, it, so say... Say, you know, the frozen lake uh, example, where it's like an agent and he's just on a grid. Well, if you run that, you know, a thousand times, you'll find for that one agent over the course of a thousand uh, iterations, the best, the best uh, path that he's taken. But within this environment, specifically more towards what you've described, in instead of, you know, specifying policies, you kind of infer policies based on just the transition states. You can actually do that. So then each individual agent instead would just be a single person on the frozen lake. And they would all be operating under different constraints with different transitions. And then each iteration, they would either go left, right, and then you would capture the optimal path based on the different transition st uh, states that you can uh, deploy. So that's something I'm kind of working on that hopefully I'll... I'll I mean, in that case, I mean, the, um, like the proportion of vehicles wouldn't help constitute your environment. So what you call agent, it's not really any, because the rules are fixed there, no? Or maybe I didn't understand. No, in this, well, in this particular case, it's not necessarily routes in terms of, oh, I'm going left or right. It's more about decisions in an abstract behavior. So, you know, I could either go left or right, I could buy this, I could buy that, I could decide to go on a toll lane or not. But it's kind of evaluating from a different perspective, you know, optimal behavior just getting out of a room versus optimal behavior of a person within a specific environment operating with imprecise information. So it's not 
to, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's uh, MDP in terms of like what you'd see, um, uh, just identifying like the best way to get out of a room. But it's more about analyzing policy for more of a macro approach, which is more of like an economic component of my background. But, but you're right. You're right. Thank you. Thanks for the talk, Justin. That was great. Um, two things. One, you mentioned sharing the code on GitHub. Um, can you just send out a link or something? Because I think that'd be really good. Yeah, yeah, the, I'll sec put it up. yeah. the second one was I think it was very clear how you're defining your agent and your environment, etc. Have you ever experimented with defining the behavior of your agent or environment based on historical data? So getting statistical distributions from things you know have happened before and sampling from them? That's yeah, <laughs> I just haven't figured out how to do it. But no, that's like having recall, I guess you could say. Yeah. So like remembering 10 time periods prior and you know, re understanding from those 10 time periods, like, hey, I'm not going to take this right or left. Um, you can actually, I've, I got it to work once where I could actually refer back to like a couple of uh, the look back. So essentially, like you'd create a, an attribute where or a series of attributes that would essentially be like, okay, here's my last, here's my last action. Here's the action before that. Here's the action before that. Here's the rewards for that. So then you can then, at my next action, you can say, well, this looks familiar. Which one of these should I do? So that's it's just kind of building out, uh, increasing the attribute list, it's just essentially building memory blocks. Perfect. Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, my question is related about. How do you apply this? Have you already applied this in clients? I mean, do you have already success histories applying this uh, method uh, with some clients? It's, it's, that more of, it, it's more of an R&D. Like, I did work on it for the oil and gas guy. That was more because they were running multi-threaded queries on a series of Oracle machines, and it was taking them three hours. And then I kind of just poured it over their code and executed in 10 minutes. So they were like, wow, OK, what other type of cap This was like, three years ago. But this is like the type of capabilities that was like, okay. Um, I mean, this wouldn't be something that you would do, you know, solely in a silo. Like, you base all your decisions based on this type of stuff, but it'd be something that you could possibly complement or maybe uh, gather some more information, especially if you don't have all the insight. But not, it's more of a, a side project for me. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, in your demo, we saw that in the end, you had this table that showed uh, what happened after each time period with all the agents, and in that way, you can evaluate how the policy is doing. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, I mean, then you have a table with hundreds of records for all the agents, for all the timestamps. How can you, in the end, really evaluate the policy and you can nicely visualize or just track some particular metrics that really show the yeah, policy so, is doing? Uh, kind of another example. Um, that I was also working on. I just thought the car one might have been more appropriate. Um, so I have this one where this one's not really a traditional MDP, but it's more. Uh, I have it like if I was a scooter company, and I have I'm trying to identify the best way. I'm putting out f like uh, for Bird or something like that. We're going to put forty thousand scooters in a new city, and we have a policy that we're going to get the max value out of this. But we want to. There's a uh, benefit and a cost of they're in good shape, acceptable shape, and bad shape. If they're in good shape, they get you $250. They're in bad shape, they lose you $1,000. So what's the policy? Do you replace those right away? Do you perform maintenance? Um, so I came up with like three different policies. Very, very similar setup, a little bit less verbose. Um, but when you get the output, kind of evaluating it at an aggregate level. Mm -hmm. So saying, in this case, um, you know, the policy three where I replace it the minute, like, any time that uh, a scooter is in acceptable or bad condition and it's reached a certain uh, value level of depreciation, I just replace it and it incurs me uh, increased, benef increased uh, revenue versus the actual cost uh, of, of um, replacing it. So it's more of an aggregate uh, uh, macro view, but then if you wanted to drill down based on, like, for example, in the last one, I felt like I was concerned with uh, people of a specific demographic, then you can kind of narrow down and query that table um, and identify, you know, what's so interesting about these folks? Why is their behavior so different? You know, uh, is it because we actually used 
census data or, or some sort of behavioral data, or is it our own bias? I don't know. Um, so it gives you a kind of couple ways to drill it down. But it, I mean, it's a data creator. It's definitely not a data uh, remover. <laughs> Um, but you can just run it multiple times, overwrite, keep what you want. Um, you can keep all the parameters. You, the only thing that will change is the random, uh, the random values you assign. And to my understanding, uh, a run of a policy is a, not a deterministic thing. It's a statistical outcome. So do you also need to evaluate uh, the distribution of the outcome of the policy? Or? Yeah, and that's, that's kind of what he was talking about. Yeah. Um, but also implementation of <clears throat> like the discount feature I mentioned you described, or the discount factor where it would actually lead components to converge because it'll be based on their own uh, uh, um, preferences, like if they're more associated with near-term rewards versus uh, future rewards, um, then it'll affect how components actually behave and it'll actually change distribution. This one's more of like a straightforward, like, you know, it's gonna churn and burn, we're just gonna see which ones give us the most money over the course of like 52 weeks or something. Right. Um, so that's kind of the things like it's, Still some things I'm hashing out. It's still kind of more challenging to do than if it was on a single node, but um, there's opportunity there. So. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> sorry, this might be a bit rambling because uh, there's something I'm not sure I fully understand. Um, so each agent, right, operates independently of all other agents, right? Mm -hmm. That's the row in the RDD. And uh, then you generate random agents, right? Like. Uh, so you get some random distribution of agents that might be very willing to change, might not be willing to change, but they're like drawn from uniform distributions. Yeah, you could you could say that the you know there'd be a few on the tails that could you know skew, but then most would fall within the standard Gaussian distribution. Yeah. And then you can build out or adjust based on that. In other cases, you know, if you have more information that could lead you to uh, infer specific behaviors in specific neighborhoods or in specific regions. Mm. Um, it's more of a, in that particular case, it was more of, I'm just guessing, but I just wanted to see like if I come up with my own kind of basic intuition and then adjust it, how does behavior change? So then each agent starts with like some starting value of like how fast the car depreciates or whatever, right? And then yeah. some process begins, it updates over time, and that's basically deterministic, right? Yes, and then exactly right. And then the transition probability is like this if-else statement that if they reach some threshold value, they will switch. That's or if some, if there's some equal statement in that, right? If one value equals something else, they will switch. Yeah. So I don't well, really understand what is the transition probability in this problem? So the transition probabilities could come from the knowledge that, so that's actually a good point where if you have a lot of data, so this is kind of the, the complement you can have from having big data that for example, one of our customers is a uh, coffee company, and if they order a particular cup of coffee at a particular time of day, we have enough, they have enough data to determine the probability that they'll maybe purchase one other item versus another. So then they can determine, okay, the likelihood that they'll buy this is something that we should then put in front of them at the cash register. And so then you can determine based on transition states, based on previous data, the transition probabilities that would essentially change over the course of a season or a month just based on preferences of the customer. So, so, so in this problem then the transition state would be between, there'll be like two states, like electric, non-electric, or something like that. In this case, the states are more, you have two types of agents, and the states are not buying, could buy, have already bought. Okay, so it'd be three states, and then at the end of this, then you basically, you then just go through and then empirically, like, based on your sort of uh, simulations, estimate, uh, or basically some frequentist uh, calculation of, like, the transition probabilities. Mm -hmm. and, and in then some cases, you would want to maybe iterate it again with uh, more accurate information. Mm -hmm. So, like, getting, actually distilling down the number of cars that are on a road it could be anywhere from 18,000, it could be 50,000. And then um, each epoch would then be like a run of like 36 months, let's say, or would it be one? In, in, this, case, in this case, it was one month. Yeah. So, so what happens now if you run this right uh, with these random uniform uh, distributions like a thousand times, like a thousand epochs? 
uh, like, or a thousand runs, but the agent is generated like uh, from scratch for every run, right? And oh, it doesn't, no. So you only generate them once. And then, so the random initialization is what occurs essentially because I didn't have specific values to assign. Mm. But then once I instantiate them, those persist. And then I, over the course of those thousand epochs, I watch as their behavior changes. Yeah. But then, so to, I think what I was getting at then is like the impact then of having these draws from like these, uh, the distributional assumptions on this. How does that impact like a sort of framing of the problem? Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> It would totally, it would, unless like in this particular case, it was more of a, an assumption based, but my own biases would come in. And so it wouldn't necessarily provide pr proper context unless I had actual statistical, you know, support to create the probabilities as well as instantiate the agents. That's what my old roommate who's a PhD statistician rubbed in my face. Because um, it's not ground in theory, but no, you're right. What's that? I mean, the policies that you've created is is a kind of gut feeling that you're applying here. What, what, what kind of decision is somebody going to take on saying, well, now I'm going to switch to another car and this is the effect that it's going to have on uh, yeah, it's the total road, the distribution or something like that. I mean, it is a nice thought experiment, but the becomes valuable if you can test it against history matched uh, uh, data where you can find out, well, what are actually my principal components and should I put into my agents and into the decision making that I'm... Uh, That's actually, so one of the core components of like agent-based modeling is actually identifying a system and creating a model that can mimic that system as close as possible at a period in time. And so in this particular case, I would pick maybe a, a year or a couple years in like the early 2010s, identify you know, who had specific cars, and then try to get my behavioral components as well as the transitions to match that to see if I can match specific trends to then use it as complementing inference on what could occur in the future. Maybe complement it with a type of forecasting in terms of population. Yeah, and have you thought about the random injection of, of policies as well? Oh yeah, in time. Yeah, so that would be one. Yeah. It's like uh, ones that just kind of manifest or kind of uh, uh, emerge based on just different behavior. Yeah, like my neighbor has an EV now. I have to have it as well. Something yeah, like that's that. so. That, on my last slide, it was yeah. like you have the guys who just buy stuff. Yeah, you know, it's and those are things like a certain population like you can't account for. So that's kind of like the the error component. Um, but you could increase that or uh, reduce that as based on possible. So, yeah. Thank you so much, guys.